All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, um, the text will be behind me if you don't have a Bible, but Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 12. Hebrews 6, 4 through 12. Let me read it for you, and then we'll dive in. For it's impossible, in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, have shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God in their own harm and holding them up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to be cursed, and its end, it, and its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, Yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire that each of you, we desire each of you, of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. If you've been at law for a while, you know that um, you've realized that we tend to go verse by verse in studying scripture and usually study books of the Bible at a time. And occasionally we'll do a topical study, like last summer we did the marriage and family series, but often what we do is we'll take a book and study chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And one of the reasons that we do this, one of the reasons we go verse by verse is because it forces us, it forces me, and it forces all of us corporately um, to go through passages that otherwise we would like to ignore, that otherwise we would like to avoid, right? I mean, you watch um, televangelists on TV and listen to what they say, Oftentimes, their message is the exact same thing, right? God wants to bless you. God wants to prosper you. God wants to give you a plane, even though you don't have a parking lot to park a plane. God wants to provide for you. He wants to put you millions of dollars into your bank account. But they're one-sided on their message, but they never get to the other side of what happens when we suffer? What happens when we go through pains and difficulties in life? Where is God in the midst of that? And so the danger of picking and choosing what we want to speak on is that oftentimes we neglect the other side. And so when we go through a passage and we study book by book, we're confronted with issues that we want to avoid. And this morning we're in a topic that's created a lot of controversy. It's created a lot of division. It's been often misinterpreted by people in the church. And so we're forced to address it because we're, we can't just simply avoid it or ignore it. But before we dive into that, the message that our text speaks about this morning is the idea of perseverance. It's the idea of keep going. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't take your foot off the pedal in pursuing Jesus. Follow Jesus with all of your heart. Don't go into cruise control mode in your spiritual life. Remember the passion that you once had when you first came to Jesus and you were in love with him and you were ready to do anything for him? Go back to that. Don't get lazy in your faith. Don't slow down. And the message that this writer is giving to this small church in Rome, a church that's going through incredible hardships, incredible difficulties, is the same message that we need to hear this morning. All of us get fatigued, don't we? All of us get tired out. All of us get worn out, especially being in a small church where all of us need to share the burden together. Otherwise, the two or three that do all the work will get completely burned out. It's hard work. We need you guys to be involved. We need you to be praying constantly. We need you to be giving constantly. We need you to be inviting people constantly. We're, we can't do this if it's just two or three people doing together. And oftentimes as we do this, it's very easy to get tired. It's very easy to get exhausted. It's very easy to get burned out. We've been there. I've been there, right? But beyond just in a church, in our own individual walks with God, it's very easy for us to get to a point where we're tired, exhausted, we fall into the danger of simply going through the rhythm, rhythms of our faith because we're doing it, right? A lot of us grew up in homes where our parents were um, grounded in, in the faith, and we would have what we would call family prayers at night, and we would be get together and we'll pray together as a family every night. But eventually, family prayer became something we did for the sake of doing it, right? It's not because we were sitting down to encounter God. We were doing it because that's what we did at the end of the day. And so there's a danger that if we're not careful, that we'll 
fall out of love with Jesus for Jesus' sake and simply begin to go through the motions of going through our faith and going through the steps of religion because that's what we're used to doing. And so we need to be reminded on a daily basis that we need to keep pursuing Jesus, that we need to keep following Jesus, that we need to keep loving Jesus. And there's a lot of things out there that distract us. Our jobs, as busy as it is, will wear us out that we're, if we're not careful, that we'll put our jobs over Jesus. Our family, as amazing as they are and as we know that they're a blessing from God, if we're not careful, our families will become something that becomes more important than Jesus. And so the writer of Hebrews reminds the right people, listen, your job is good, your family is good, all of the stuff that you're pursuing is good, but there's nothing better than Jesus. Jesus is better than your job. He's better than your work. He's better than your family. He's better than the pursuits that you're pursuing. He's better than your dreams. He's better than your desires. He's better than keep pursuing him. Because when you are satisfied in Jesus, everything else in life will make sense. When you are satisfied in Jesus, you'll find joy and contentment and peace. But when you are pursuing joy and contentment in everything else, you'll never be content. You'll never be satisfied. And so the writer constantly, in the book of Hebrews, we talked about this last week when Bryce said it, but he's over and over reminding people, listen, Jesus is better. He's better. The entire theme of the book of Hebrews is he's better. He's better than what you're pursuing. He's better than what you're dreaming for. Keep pursuing Jesus. And the writer, if you looked at Hebrews, if you've been with us, you've seen like he's very systematic in his study. He goes, starts off, and he talks about how Jesus is so much better than the angels. It's like a textbook. It's like one of those professors who, you guys have one of these professors who kind of looks at the notes and just simply reads the note, never looks up at you, and he just simply reads like a Ben Stein kind of character, um, and he just reads and reads and reads, and then looks up, class dismissed, you're out, right? You guys have any of those guys ever? Um, and this is what the writer of Hebrews is almost like. He's just Going through systematically, Jesus is better than the angels, and here's why. Jesus is better than any human being, and here's why. And Jesus is better than whatever you're pursuing, any other man, here's why. And then all of a sudden he looks up, and he realizes that people are dozing off, and people are falling asleep, and he changes his tone. He goes, wake up, you idiots, you immature babies. What is wrong with you? Do you not grasp what I'm saying? And that's what he does in the passage we looked at last week and the passage we look at this week. He says, wake up. What's wrong with you? Are you not grasping this? Jesus is better, and here you are, falling asleep. You're immature babies. You're not growing in your faith. Wake up. Grow up. And he's talking to people that are going through incredible difficulties in their life. They're going through incredible challenges. They've lost jobs. Family members have rejected them. People have turned on them. The government is against them. So he's talking to these people who are still coming to church, but they're not growing in their faith. Some of them are pursuing Jesus in spite of their struggles, but there's a group of people in there that are on the fence with Jesus. And he's addressing that group. It's a group that I would call almost Christians, right? They aren't growing or maturing in their faith. They're like chameleons. They look really good in church. They know all the right words to say. They know the lingo. They know the Christianese words to say. But when they step out into the world, they look exactly like the world as well. Chameleons. And the author is speaking to them. He says, you know all the right stuff. You know all the right deeds. You know what to do. You know when to raise your hands. You know when to pray. You know all of this stuff. But your heart doesn't belong to Jesus. Jesus doesn't own your heart. He doesn't have you. You might have a profession of faith, but you don't have a relationship with him. And listen, there's a group of people in every church like that. Every church in the world. There was back then, there is today. This morning, this is the group that the writer is addressing. And one of the goals of the writer, he's not threatening genuine followers of Jesus. His goal isn't this morning to make you doubt your salvation if you genuinely love your, if you love Jesus. And that's not my goal this morning either. He's confronting those almost Christians, people that are on the fence. And he's going to tell them, listen, you're in a dangerous place. Because you're, if you're not careful, eventually your heart will, heart will get hardened and you'll begin to walk away. You'll come to a point where you'll hear the gospel so much, but your heart becomes hardened and there's a point of no return. Your heart will grow cold and you'll just walk away. And he doesn't want to see that happen. 
And he also wants to talk to the church who are sitting there trying to follow Jesus and serve Jesus. And they look around and Jim and Bob and Mary are all leaving. They're abandoning the faith. And the church is wondering, what's going on? Why are they leaving? Because it was very common back then, just as it is today, that there'll be people that grow up in the church, have done all the stuff, and eventually come to a point where they just leave, right? They just give up on their faith, or um, they've been burned, or something happens and they reject Jesus. They, people that used to profess Jesus, people that used to follow Jesus, people that used to be on stage, people that used to teach Sunday school, but eventually they came to a point when life got hard, when things got difficult, when their expectations of what Christianity was supposed to be didn't match up with the reality of what they were facing. They just kind of gave up. When they thought that following Jesus was going to create a better life for them, but in fact it created more hardships and difficulties because the world was opposed to Jesus, and they just said, you know what, I'm done. I'm walking away. People in the church are looking at them and are saying, why are these guys walking away? And what the writer is going to do this morning in our text is he's going to reiterate a lot of the teachings of Jesus in his Gospels. There's a story that Jesus tells in the Gospels about a parable of four soils. I don't know if you guys remember this, but he talks about these seeds being planted or thrown into four different fields. And three of those fields, the, the roots never get stabilized. It never grows. One of them it grows a little bit, but then it dies. But there's one soil, the good soil, where the roots go down, the plant begins to grow, and fruit actually begins to bear. And Jesus would illustrate in that story that that soil where the fruit began to show up, that's a genuine believer. That's how you know a person is a believer, by the fruit that shows up in their life. Their life has been changed from the inside out. They didn't duct tape fruit onto the branches to say, hey, this is a good fruit. They're produced naturally. It began to grow in their lives. Their, their lives were evident by the transformation that happened. Listen, Jesus himself teaches, there's going to be a lot of people that say, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, but they really don't. They love the idea of Jesus. They love the stuff that Jesus can give them, but they don't really love Jesus. And this is the people that he's going to address today. There are all sorts of people out there that will talk about how much they love Jesus. It was even happening in his day. He had a huge crowds following him. There's multitudes of people pursuing Jesus. But at the end, when things got hard and difficult, they quickly jumped off the train and they quit. Here's a church that's struggling to press on, struggling to cling on to Jesus, struggling to persevere in spite of difficulties, and the church is wondering, what's going on? The best parallel I could think of is like the movie Hunger Games. Have you seen that? Um, but in the movie, um, these guys are trying to save their lives, trying to do everything possible to stay alive while everyone around them is falling like flies all around them, right? They're alone, they're scared, they're wondering, what if they're next? It's not like you get, it's laser tag, you get shot and you're out. It's, you get shot, you're dead, right? I mean, that's, that's what's happening here. Let me be honest, some of you in this room, maybe some of you that are watching, have legitimate fear of thinking that you'll walk away from Jesus. And the goal of the writer this morning is to encourage you and teach you and point you back to Jesus. It's not to scare you. It's not to frighten you. It's to bring you back to Savior, bring you back to how great Jesus is. And some of you in this room or watching, you haven't given your lives fully to Jesus. And this morning, he's going to encourage you, listen, he's worth it. He's so much better than the things you're pursuing. He's so much better than your dreams, your aspirations. He's worth it. So this morning what we're going to do, he's going to give us a warning against not persevering. He's going to give us an encourage, encouragement to persevere. And then finally, he's going to give us hope to persevere. And I'm going to go through these really quickly. The first one's probably where I'm going to spend most of the time because that's where it creates most confusion. But in verse 4, he begins and he gives a warning against not persevering. He says it's impossible to restore to repentance those who have. And then he begins to list off all of these different characteristics. And he begins by warning them. One thing you got to understand is that this passage right here has been misinterpreted by Christians as if Christians can lose their salvation. I understand this morning in our church there are folks from different backgrounds, right? We've got folks that grew up in various different traditions, traditions of our faith. Some of us have been raised up in faith traditions that believed our salvation wasn't secure, that we could actually lose our salvation. 
Others of us in this room have grew up in traditions where we believe that our salvation is secure because of Jesus' finished work on the cross. It's finished. So we have different viewpoints this morning. And listen, so far we've worked really, really well together, right? Theological disagreements have not created a division in the mission of the church. You might disagree with me on this topic. You might disagree with one another on this topic. But our goal ultimately is to point you to love Jesus, pursue Jesus, follow Jesus, where doubting your salvation isn't even an issue, right? We want you to be so in love with him that nothing else matters. And so that's what we want to encourage you. But our topic has caused a lot of issues in the church. For me, personally, I don't believe a genuine follower of Jesus can lose their salvation. I don't think you can. Because the evidence of a genuine believer of Jesus is the fruit that's in their lives. I find incredible comfort, I find incredible encouragement in the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, or what I call it the preservation of the saints, that God will keep those who are his. That if I'm his, I'm in his arms and he will not let me go. I find incredible comfort in that. That motivates me to live my life. I'm his. I'm safe. I'm secure. I can do whatever he's calling me because I'm his. I find reason to pursue God even more in in that doctrine. Because if he saved me, if he redeemed me, if he did it, then what I want to do is stay close to him. And so I find comfort in that. Those of you who belong to him, the enemy cannot snatch you from his hands. You're in his hands. He's got you and you can't fall through the cracks. Jesus says this, my sheep, my people, hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Listen, that's Jesus' hand. And then he goes on. My father who has given them to me is greater than all of this and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hands. Listen, he's saying, I got you. My father's got you, and if you are mine, you ain't going anywhere. No enemy is going to knock you out of my hands. No um, adversity is going to knock you out of my hand. You are in my hands. But he gives a warning here. And he mentions five different things. Let me look at that real quick. First thing he says, it's impossible in the case of those who have been enlightened. What does that mean? Enlightened basically means to have your lights turned on. It means... Either God has turned the light on for you, or you realize how sinful you are. You come to the point to realize that, man, your life is a mess, right? You screwed up. You're a mess, and you need help. There's a lot of people who've been enlightened, but that doesn't make you a Christian just because you've been enlightened. You don't become a follower of Jesus just because you know how bad you are. Everyone knows how bad they are. No one in the world thinks that they're perfect. Everyone knows how sinful they are. Everyone knows why, that they need help. Enlightenment doesn't mean salvation. These people had that. They were enlightened by the gospel message. Secondly, they tasted the heavenly gifts. It means they were experiencing something. These people had a Christian experience. All of us know people that had Christian experiences, right? We know people that when they were young, they would raise their hands in a message, or they would walk down an aisle, or they'll fill out a card, or they were baptized. They did something at some point in their lives, but the evidence wasn't there that they were following Jesus. Eventually, when things got difficult, when things got hard, they abandoned it. They had an experience, but their life wasn't different. Their life wasn't changed. The third thing, they tasted Jesus. I'm sorry, same thing. They tasted Jesus, but they didn't like what he had to offer. The other week, I was at Costco, um, and I was walking around. And, you know, if you've been to Costco, you see, like, they've got these stands everywhere where you could try everything, right? You college students, 35 bucks a year, once a year. You can go to Costco every day and you can get a whole meal there and just feed yourself, right? It's perfect if you're a college student. Um, But I was there and I was trying everything. I go try the juice, I tried the crackers, I try the piece of fish that they had, and I'm filling my stomach up with the food that they have. However, just because I walk around and tried everything doesn't mean I went and bought everything, right? Doesn't mean I took everything that I tried home. I can taste it and not buy it because one, I might not have liked it, two, I might not have had the money for it. Or three, I simply didn't think it was worth the price. Or I was on a diet. Okay, lying. I'm not on a diet. Like to eat. I tasted it, sampled it, might have even liked it. But there are a lot of reasons I didn't buy it or take it home. This is what these people did. They tasted Jesus. Wow, he sounds so good. He's delicious. He's 
he's appealing. I really like everything Jesus offers, but man, all these other things, it's competing. I don't want to, following Jesus means this. I don't want to give this up. They tasted what Jesus was like, but they weren't fully committed. And you guys know folks like that, right? They're like, oh yeah, I should go back to church one day, or I, um, but really I'm too busy pursuing this or pursuing that. Tasted Jesus, but never fully gave their lives to him. That's what these guys were doing. And there are folks in our, in our families, in our friends, that have tasted him, but never gave their lives to Jesus. The third thing he says is they shared in the Holy Spirit. Here's where it gets a little tricky. Shared in the Holy Spirit. Nowhere else in Scripture does the Bible talk about people sharing in the Holy Spirit, but here. Everywhere else where you talk about the Holy Spirit, a person is indwelt, controlled by the Holy Spirit. These people shared, but they didn't. They weren't indwelt by the Holy Spirit. These are completely different terms. Listen, Jesus doesn't hold your hands. He doesn't just simply walk with you. When you are engulfed with Jesus, when you are baptized into the Holy Spirit, what happens is he takes over your life. He's not simply walking with you hand in hand and saying, go this way, go that way. He reigns inside of you. You are controlled by him. That's what happens when you become a follower of Jesus. You don't share him. He takes over your life. Next thing he says is, have a taste the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. They heard the word of God. They heard it preached. They heard it preached in the synagogues. They heard it preached in the church week in and week out. They hear about Jesus. It still doesn't make them a Christian. They've seen miracles. Maybe even they perform miracles. And you're going to say, wait a minute, don't you have to be a Christian to perform miracles? No. Jesus says it in the Gospels. He says, there's going to come a day when people are going to come to me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name? And Jesus is going to look at them and say, no, I never knew you. Depart from me. Listen, just because someone speaks it, just because someone does it, just because some cool things happen from some people that you watch on TV, doesn't make them a Christian. And so when you watch someone on TV who looks really, really cool, and then they have a complete moral failure, and they're living their lives completely contrary to the gospel, and you wonder if they, what happened? Maybe they weren't a follower of Jesus. I'm not saying they aren't. Some of them have a genuine fall, and they come back to repentance. But do not base your faith on what another person does. Your faith isn't based on, wow, this guy is able to do miracles, so I'm going to follow him. That's not what you're supposed to do. You follow Jesus. Follow him and him alone. People will come. People will fall. People will mess up. But Jesus never fails. See, this is the description of the almost Christian. They experienced so much of God, but they were yet so far from God. Deep down, they didn't love Jesus for Jesus' sake. And you know who you could take as a perfect example of this? Is a guy by the name of Judas Iscariot, right? He was there. He heard the word of God. He did miracles himself. He saw the miracles. He tasted, shared the goodness of God. He shared the Holy Spirit and how God was working. And yet at the end of the day, he rejects Jesus. Was he, he experienced all of these things, but did he love Jesus? No. Was he a Christian? No, he wasn't. And the writer is saying, listen, there's a lot of Judases in our church, in our churches. And he gives them a warning. He says, having fallen away now to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding them up for contempt. The word fall there is literally means to fail through to a commitment. It means that you could be so near and yet so far from Jesus. They could have all the right things to say. They could understand a lot of theological truth and yet still not know Jesus. They don't have a personal relationship with him. Can I say this also? This doesn't just happen overnight. It's not like you woke up one morning and say, I'm just going to give up on Jesus. It never happens that way. It's always a process. It always is a process. It starts with unbelief. You begin to question the promises of God. You begin to doubt what God says is true, and so you begin to dabble in sin. And eventually you begin dabbling more and more in sin and it leads to disobedience and you end up in apostasy and you walk away. The reality is 
you're probably never a Christian anyway. That's part of the reality. So the question this morning is, isn't whether a person lost their salvation or the question is, were they really a Christian in the first place? Just because they did all these things or shared all these things? Because none of us in this room, and no theological theologian will say that someone can willfully live in blatant sin against God and pursue God. None of us would argue that. But the question is, were they really saved in the first place? Or did they just have some sort of experience that made them look like a follower of Jesus, like a chameleon? The text says that it's impossible for these guys to come back. I've been trying to think about how to illustrate this. And the thought came up with flu season and vaccination. But even better, yesterday, um, not better, but yesterday my daughter, um, we were at a siblings class preparing for the new baby to come. And they're teaching my kids how to um, change diapers and all this cool stuff. And, um, and afterward, right in the middle of that, she started complaining of a stomach ache. Um, like a really bad stomach ache. Um, she couldn't move. She couldn't breathe. I mean, we have no idea what's going on. I'm, I take her home. I'm carrying her, and uh, she's in a lot of pain even when I'm walking with her. Um, and I didn't know what to do, so finally got scared and br rushed her to the ER. And when we get to the ER, the doctors or the nurse is asking, does she have all of her shots? Does she have her vaccinations and all this stuff? And um, eventually, as soon as she walks into the hospital, she throws up and gets better, and we just wasted, like, several hundred dollars for her to throw up in the hospital floor. But um, in the midst of that process, um, the doctor started asking about vaccinations, right? And so Nicole was like, hey, what's a vaccination? And so explaining, talking to her uh, about what a vaccination is, is that they put a shot of something that's actually bad into you so that your body can be immune so that if you ever get the full exposure to it, your body is immune to it, right? And I might not explain it right. Chevy, you can correct me later. But, um, but that's basically what the idea is. A vaccination immunizes by giving a very mild case of the disease. And here's the same idea. You can hear the gospel message over and over and over again. You can hear God loves you. God saves you. God wants to redeem you. God is pursuing you. You can hear all of that. But if you don't respond, eventually you'll become immune to it. The spiritual system becomes more and more unresponsive and sensitive to the gospel message that you're hearing. And eventually you come to the point of no return. You aren't coming back. See, this is the danger of being around the gospel so much and not actually walking with Jesus. Some of you in this, some of you think that you can, you have all of your life to respond, right? You can respond eventually. But you, right now you hear the message week in and week out and your heart is getting hardened because you're tasting the sweet message of the gospel and you're not letting it penetrate and change your life and eventually your heart will get so hard and so cold that you'll walk away. And the writer is warning to you, be careful, be wise. That's why over and over in Hebrews, the writer says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. This is why he emphasizes it now. Don't wait. Don't think you have your whole life to follow Jesus. If you aren't careful, your heart will be hardened. There will be a point where you cannot return. If you keep rejecting him, you're exposing yourself to his probability. And let me also say this. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, who are pursuing Jesus, listen, it is not our place or our right to determine who has reached that point of no return. That is not our job. That's God's job. That's God's issue. We don't determine the point of no return for somebody. Because listen, there's a lot of prodigals out there. Some of you in this room were prodigals. You wandered away from God. You, you grew up in the faith, but then you rejected and walked away but God slowly brought you back in. There's a lot of prodigals out there. This is why we never stop giving up praying for someone. We keep praying, we keep praying, we keep praying because we never know. It might be the thief that's hanging on the cross with his last breath and they'll come back to Jesus. So we never give up on people around us. We don't make the determination of who's an apostate. We keep praying for those around us. So he warns them. He warns them of the dangers of being around Jesus and not pursuing Jesus. But then he also gives us an encouragement. In verse 9, he says, listen, though we speak it this way, but for you guys, listen, beloved brothers, 
We know there's better things, things that pertain to salvation. He's convinced, listen, you guys, you're children of God. He calls them beloved. He sees the fruit of Jesus in their lives. As far as he can tell, they have a genuine faith in Jesus. He sees Jesus work in them. And he says the following in verse 10. He says that God is not unjust. So to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name to serving the saints as you still do. This is one of the greatest verses in scripture. It is such a powerful verse if you let it penetrate your hearts. Do you realize what he's saying here? He says that the reason that you are doing the things that you do is because of your overflow of love for God. That you love people because you're in love with God. I know you love Jesus, and I can see it overflowing in how you love people around you. I see it. Here's the difference between someone who's self-centered and gospel-centered. I'm not loving others so that God can love me but I'm loving others because God has loved me more than I can ever deserve. And so now out of the overflow of God's love for me, I can now love my neighbors. I can love people. I can love my enemies because I have experienced love that's immeasurable. They love God and it's overflowing in their love for one another. This is encouraging because it says that God will never forget this. He won't ignore your love for him. If you forget everything else this morning, remember this. Sin, God will forget if you're a believer. Your sin, God will forget if you're a believer. But your deeds of kindness done in his name, he will never forget. He'll never forget it. Even if you forget it, he'll never forget it. He remembers it and it says he writes them down. All the times you served and loved people and you don't even remember doing it because you weren't doing it for other people to notice, but you were doing it because you loved Jesus. You might forget about him, but God never does. You might not even remember doing it, but God remembers it. He writes them down. In the book of Malachi, he talks about a book of remembrance of those who feared God, esteemed his name. When you do things out of your overflow for love for God, listen, when no one else notices, God does. God does. When you love your roommate simply because out of the overflow of your love for God, God notices. When you Stop and talk to that homeless person and do it because of the overflow of your love for God. And no one else will ever know about it. Listen, God does. When you decide to treat your enemies nicely and love them even when they don't deserve it, and no one notices, listen, God does. God sees everything that you do and every act of kindness that you do in his name, he knows, he writes it, he remembers it. Even if no one else knows it, God does. Listen, the world doesn't get it. It doesn't get people who love others because of an overflow of love for God. Because the world is very self-centered. I do things so I can get something back. But one who's been transformed by the gospel says, I do something because my life has been changed. Now I don't have to do anything to get something from people. I do this because God has changed me. This is encouraging. It is to encourage you to keep persevering, keep pushing, keep going, because there's a God who's watching you, and he sees everything that you do. And then finally, he gives us hope, hope to persevere. Verse 11, he says, We desire that each of you show the same earnestness and have full assurance of the hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and and patience inherit the promise. Here's what he's saying. He's warned them. He's encouraged them. Now he's telling them to keep pressing on, keep enduring for the hope that you have coming and the hope that you see in other people. The word there, desire, is the Greek word basically meaning lust, right? Every other passage where this Greek word is written in the New Testament, it means lust. It's negative. But this is the only place where it's written in a positive form. And you have the idea what it means. Basically, I want you. I want you to do this. I want you to base your hope on what is to come and what you see in God doing in other people around you. It's like a boxing coach yelling from the sidelines, from the ringside, saying, keep going, keep moving, dodge your feet, keep pushing. I played a lot of um, Mike Tyson um, punch out when I was growing up. Dodge your feet, move, keep punching, right arm, left arm. It's, it's that coach that's saying, keep doing it, don't give up. Keep pushing on, keep perseverance. Hope is a powerful thing, right? Hope is what keeps people pushing on, keep going. If a cancer patient gets paid, um, it's what keeps a cancer patient, 
patient fighting. It's what keeps athletes pushing on and putting their work in during the day, day in and day out. It's what keeps us as believers um, in the race despite turmoil and suffering and hardship. This is why week in and week out after communion, I remind you that there is a day coming where what we hope for, we will see, right? We will see Jesus. And on that day, there's not going to be any more pain. There's not going to be any heartbreak. There's not going to be any more tears. There's not going to be any more sickness. There's not going to be any more struggles. There's not going to be any more disappointments. There's not going to be any loss. There's hope that even though life is hard today, there's hope. Think about this. In every area of life, hope is fueled by history because of what you do. Because what do you do? What do you do when there's hope? If you're a cancer patient, you're fighting through it because you know that someone else has already fought through it and survived. If you're an athlete and you have a major injury and you're working through it, you're rehabbing, and you're not giving up because you know that someone else has gone through the same thing and they made it back. I can do this because someone else has done this. History fuels hope. And this is what he's telling them. He says, look back at the long line of godly men, godly women who have loved Jesus and through the centuries pushed through hardships, pushed through difficulties, pushed through pain. And when other people fell around them, when other people gave up, they continue to push forward and strive and they didn't give up and they reached their goal and now they're enjoying Jesus. Look at them. Hebrews 11, a passage that we'll get to in this book. This talks about these men, men and women who have gone through difficulties, hardships, never gave up, never quit. When life was hard, they pursued Jesus. Listen, guys, you need to hear this this morning because life is hard. Life is difficult, but Jesus is worth it. He's worth it. Some of you feel like you're the only one that's going through what you're going through. You live in a huge city, and sometimes you feel like you're the only ones. No one understands no one sympathizes with you. Your family doesn't. Your co-workers don't. Your church folks don't even understand. And the writer is writing to encourage you that you aren't the only one. You come from a long line of people who have done this before you. They went to battle for Jesus. And in spite of hardships and difficulties, they persevered. They didn't give up. They pushed through the end. And listen, if they can do it, the same God that was with them is the same God that's with you. You can make it. John Piper says it so eloquently. He says, I need to hear this message over and over again because I drift into a peacetime mindset as certainly as rain falls down and flames go up. I'm wired by nature to love the same toys the world loves. I start to fit in. I start to love what others love. I start to call earth home. And before you know it, I'm calling luxuries needs and using my money just the way unbelievers do. I begin to forget the war. I don't think about people perishing. Missions and unreached peoples drop out of my mind. I stop dreaming about the triumphs of grace. I sink into a secular mindset that looks first to what man can do, not what God can do. It's a terrible sickness. And I thank God for those who have forced me in again and again toward a wartime mindset. He's reflecting on these men in Hebrews 11 and other men who have go- men and women who have gone through the faith. And he says, I love reading about them because I realize that they did it. They persevered. And if they can do it, I can do it. If they can make it, I can make it. Probably one of the greatest examples in Scripture is a guy by the name of Peter. A guy who pushed hard Follow Jesus. And listen, he wasn't perfect at all, was he? He was probably the biggest screw-up in Scripture. Everyone around him deserted Jesus. And Peter deserted him as well. In fact, Peter denies Jesus not once, not twice, but three times after Jesus warned him that he was going to do it. He was the one who was constantly putting his foot in the mouth. But what did he do? He confessed. I love the scene in John where they realize they're on the boat and they're fishing and Jesus tells them to catch the fish and they catch the fish and they realize it's Jesus. Peter, he's half naked, jumps into the river and swims back to Jesus even though he's fallen, even though he's messed up. He returns back to Jesus. See, that's the biggest difference between Peter and Judas. 
Both of them sin. Both of them screw up. But Judas never runs back to Jesus. Peter runs back to him. Very different scenarios. So we begin to find that failure is not final with the grace of God. Listen, I don't know where you're coming from this morning. I don't know how badly you have fallen. I don't know how badly you've screwed up your life. I don't know what hole you're in this morning. But I can tell you that by the grace of God, your story doesn't have to be defined by where you are today. The final chapter of your life has not been written. By the grace of God, you can change. And by the grace of God, things can turn around. Listen, there are people in this room that are testimonies of that. God, when we were in the worst of our scenarios, rescued us. He saved us. He redeemed us. And if there's one thing you could do is you can come week in and week out, look around at the people around you and say, if they can make it, I can make it. That's why community is so important. That's why the church is so important, because if you're by yourself, you'll feel hopeless. See, this is our hope today. This is what the writer is encouraging us to do. Even if you've fallen, there's grace for you. Even if you're in a hole, the grace of God can lift you out of the hole. Failure is not final when it comes to the grace of God. So let's persevere. Let's push in. Let's go hard after Jesus because he's worth it. We come to the table this morning. We have the elements on the side. The bread and the juice represent the body and the blood of Jesus. Would you take a moment this morning to actually pray, to think, to commune with God? Some of you in this room, you've been so busy this week. You've had no conversation with God. No week whatsoever. No conversation whatsoever. This is your time. Would you go before God? If you need to repent of where you're at, would you repent? If you're not pursuing Jesus with all your heart, would you repent and would you say, Jesus, help me? Help me. He loves to answer those types of prayers. This is an opportunity for me to kind of step away, for you to talk to God. And when you're ready, you can come and grab the elements if you're a Christian. Listen, if you don't know Jesus this morning, this table is not for you. You can sit, you can watch, you can meditate on the words that were spoken. And if you don't know Jesus, I would love to pray with you. But the table for the rest of us is a reminder that we don't do this by our own ability, by our own strength, by our own skill. Someone went ahead of us, paid the price, and that same someone is with us every step of the way. It places our hope not in ourselves, but in Jesus. And so as you examine your hearts and your lives, when you're ready, I invite you to come grab the elements. In a few moments, I'll come back up and we'll partake of it together.